Praise uh, the living God and uh, welcome to the second last presentation in the Tabernacle series. And uh, I want to believe God has been with us and uh, we have been traveling a journey. And now we are coming to an end and just to wrap up the things that uh, we have been speaking of. This is uh, the presentation. Uh, Maranatha, it won't be long. And so let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, help us as we put uh, together these last points that your name shall be glorified and the glory of man shall be put in dust that only Christ may be seen. And so give us uh, a knowledge of your word and an understanding of it. In Jesus' name, amen. And so uh, I'd like to welcome us to this uh, number 18 in the series. And uh, that is uh, Maranatha, it won't be long. We see the forces of this world coming together and confederating together for the last crisis the gathering together of uh, the final push and the last battle on this face of the earth. The battle between the good and the evil. On one side is gathered the heavenly agencies and the captain of the host is Jesus Christ himself. And on the other side is um, the enemy of uh, righteousness. There is uh, the devil and his angels. And so, let us see what uh, the Lord will want us to learn. And uh, in looking at this, I want us to go in the past. Always the past will be able to help us understand the future. For there is nothing new under the sun. That, that shall be, it has already been, and God requireth of the history. And so, we look into the history which uh, gives us the glimpse of uh, what is coming upon the face of the earth. And uh, I went through some of this information, but uh, I left it somewhere, and uh, I'd like just to pick it from where I left it. And so the presentation is Maranatha. It won't be long. And you can be sure that this journey is not going to be long. And so what is happening behind the closed doors, closer to Sunday Law in America and the whole part of the world, we view the, <clears throat> or we go through the, the sentiments of the national reform in the years 18, in the late 1880s, and uh, how Jonas was able to go through this and uh, prevent uh, a calamity that could have come through God using him to prevent a shame to the church which was not, not ready. And so we look at the National Reformed Constitution in that time and uh, look at uh, the voices of this time, what they are echoing, nothing else but what has been in the past. We are told of the children of Isaac, a man who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. The heads of them were 200, and all their brothers were at their command. So God is looking for a people in this world, minute men, whom he can use to be his voice. Why should we be concerned with what is happening in America? Revelation chapter 13 verses 11 to 18 reveals unto us why all our eyes should be in America and our ears be in that uh, mighty nation. The land of the free, but uh, soon it shall be the land of exile. That uh, freedom, we see freedom being taken from the people, bit by bit being shredded. But uh, who can understand? The wise shall be able to understand. 
but then uh, the wicked will not understand a thing. And so we are brought into the history of uh, the near coming of Jesus Christ back in 1880s. And uh, we look at what kind of events were transpiring and then come to our time and see uh, the same events transpiring at such a time. The presentation is Maranatha. It won't be so long and it won't be long before we see Christ coming in the clouds of the air. And so our focus today in the series of the Tabernacles is uh, the voice of uh, the second beast, the voice of the second beast which arises from the earth to give life to the image of the beast. Let us look at what happened in 1880s when they wanted to make the Sunday law. And uh, why should we bring this presentation? Maranatha, it won't be long. We are told that when uh, the laws of God are brought to naught, then it is a time for him to work. And we see the law of God is being done away slowly with slowly. Um, we are told as we near the end that those who fight for the liberty of conscience, the liberty of nations shall, shall be subverted and there will be no other work to be done than the work in the medical missionary, but then the religious liberty will be withdrawn. And so when the religious liberty is withdrawn, then we don't have the worship of true God in his sanctuary, but a false worship that is pervading the whole world. It means then the sanctuary services comes to an end and those who are ready end us into the blessedness of the Lord and those who are not ready, they are counted to be foolish virgins. So what happened in 1880s and how is it coming back to us? We are told, and uh, I want us to look at this information because it gets interesting every day how they spoke then and how they are speaking today. We propose to give the Americans, the world, a view of our constitution as it will appear when amended to conform to the views of the national reformers. And you can say the apostate Protestantism. This is a matter that concerns everyone and will do some so more and more as the national reform or the apostate Protestantism grows in influence and power. Now, I want these words to start singing in our hearts, to sing in our minds, so that we may understand what we are speaking. This is proved by District Secretary Coleman's words that uh, the existence of a Christian institution, constitution, will differentiate every logically consistent infidel. This is in Christian Statesman, November 1883. This was their constitution when they were bringing about the Blair Law, the Sunday Law. And uh, I'm glad for those who are joining in. Uh, I believe that this is uh, very pertinent information that uh, you would like to hear. Welcome, Sister Veronica, and uh, I think that is Sister Cheryl. And uh, you are not late in the meeting. We are looking at Maranatha. It won't be long, and we are just starting. And what are we talking about? We are looking at this issue of... Uh, 18, the late 1880s when uh, there was uh, the Blair Law that was to bring about the Sunday Law, what constitution the National Reform was using, and then we look at the apostate Protestantism, what they are speaking right now as we speak. And so uh, we are told that uh, in their constitution, they were talking about bringing a about a Christian constitution in the USA. And they say that uh, the existence of it will differentiate every logically consistent infidel. And it will be interesting to see who is an infidel in this matter as they talk about infidelity. And uh, Reverend J.C.K. John Calvin Knox Milligan says, when the amendment is adopted of uh, having a Christian constitution in the USA, how will it act upon the civil and political rights of infidels? And you see, they say the infidels are Jewish and etc. Et now, the Jewish, who are the Jewish? The Jewish per se is not Israel, but what they are referring is a people who identify themselves as the Jewish. 
and uh, you really can't escape spiritual Jewish there who are Seventh-day Adventists. When the amendment is adopted, how will it act upon the civil and political rights of infidels? Jewish ETC, this depends largely upon themselves. The worst result will be to disfranchise them. And you understand what the word disfranchise means, take everything they have. Maranatha, it won't be long when everything shall be taken from you. So come Lord Jesus, come. When the religion of Jesus Christ is put away, what uh, we have is anarchy. And uh, when you read in Judges, in the times of anarchy, everyone did what seemed best in their sight at that time. And uh, as the religious liberty subverts the, uh, the, the freedom of nations, we shall be brought into this anarchy where everyone shall act as they want. Continued on, we are told, before any officer enters on the execution of his office, he shall take the following oath of office. I do solemnly swear in the presence of the eternal God that during the whole term of my office I'll serve the same eternal God to the uttermost of my power according as he hath required in his most holy word contained in the Old and New Testaments and according to the same word will maintain the true religion of Christ Jesus. So their work as a Christian nation is to maintain the true religion of Jesus Christ. You can wonder how a Sunday keeper can say that he will maintain a true religion of Jesus Christ. This is not a disparage to the faithful who are Sunday keepers, but uh, it is just out of norm for a person who doesn't recognize the fourth commandment to say that he will maintain the true religion of Jesus Christ. And uh, what shall they do when the American constitution becomes a, a Christian constitution and shall abolish all false religion contrary to the same and shall rule the people committed to my charge according to the will and command of God revealed in his word and shall procure to the uttermost of my power to the church of God and the whole Christian people true and perfect peace. This is a genuine national reform oath and is strictly according to the doctrines which that association preaches. Since when did a government enforce its officials and citizens to religion? And then it sounds like Daniel chapter 3 and 16, chapter 3 and 6 says uh, Alonzo Trevor Jones. And so they say this will necessitate the reform of Article 1 of amendments to the Constitution so that it is first clause shall read thus. And uh, I know our sisters are. Uh, people from the USA and they understand their constitution so well than we in Africa understand it. And those who are listening and watching and they are from that land of the free, they understand their constitution. The constitution of America says, uh, or uh, it shall read, Congress shall make laws respecting the re establishment of the Christian religion. Now, the constitution of America, the article number one, of amendment says Congress shall not make law but listen the word not has been taken out Congress shall make laws respecting the establishment of the Christian religion prohibiting the free exercise of all other religion and all all religion and abridging the freedom of speech and of the press in religious matters this is confirmed the, by the words of district secretary Reverend M. A. Galt who says thus our remedy for all these malefic influences is to have the government simply set up the moral law and recognize God's authority behind it and lay its hand on any religion that does not conform to it. Christian Statesman, January 13, 1887. This, is, this was to, towards the Blair Law when America was becoming a Christian, uh, 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 um, when the Constitution was being made Christian per se. Just here, and as fitting comment upon these words of Mr. Galt, we may very properly insert a remark of Mr. Waddington. When the authority of heaven is pleaded for the infliction of punishment, it creates an implacable and remorseless spirit, since it supersedes by a stern necessity all ordinary motives and stifles the natural pleadings of humanity. Have you ever heard the voice of uh, the devil incarnate? Have you ever come across the voice of the devil incarnate? I think you are reading those words right now. God even does not do this because force is the last resort of every religion. 
but to hear somebody says that they will be acting for the sake of God and then goes ahead and says, when the authority of heaven is pleaded for the infliction of punishment, it creates an implacable and remorseless spirit. When did God become remorseless? When still there is probation. And even when probation is closed, the Lord has to do away with sin and sinners because of remorse and because of the love he has. For they will not endure and enjoy his presence. So why force them to be in his presence when they cannot endure it? For So whatever he is doing, he is doing out of remorse. But here is a constitution which is to run America which says that uh, by presenting, representing God they will be remorseless in spirit. And since working for God, it supersedes by a stern necessity all ordinary motives and stifles the natural pleading of humanity. And so it doesn't matter if somebody is hungry, it doesn't matter if somebody is sick, it doesn't matter in which uh, condition the person is, there is no remorse, there is uh, sternness in necessity and stifling upon this person's life. You, you, you can start having a picture of uh, this land of freedom, the USA, when uh, their constitution becomes a Christian constitution. Further observant in the movement should be noted that it is certain that all these changes in the body of the constitution will not be made without universal and almost endless controversy. Now, you know universal means the whole world. After they make it in America, they are saying they are going uh, 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 full head uh, uh, universally with this thing that is in the whole world. And uh, it will not be done without endless controversy. No wonder there is a progression to make all the constitutions of all nations meet international standard. What does it mean by international standard? Of course, it is to conform to American ethics. You see, every country, every nation is uh, under the umbrella of the USA. They are speaking like USA. And the USA is starting to speak like the dragon. And so if USA is starting to speak like the dragon, then <clears throat> you can understand that all nations are speaking like the dragon. These are interesting things to read. They make us sad, but nonetheless, it's inevitable that they must happen. The changes will come gradually and probably only after the whole framework of Bible legislation has been thoroughly conversed conversed by Congress and state legislatures, by the Supreme Courts of the United States and of the several states, nations as well, and by lawyers and citizens. And you know what they say? An outpouring of the Spirit might soon secure it. And what is this, an outpouring of the Spirit? You, you read in Revelation chapter 13 that apost and protestantism made the fire come out of heaven to fall upon men. This is the kind of the outpouring of Spirit they are talking about these false miracles that uh, will bring about spiritualism and everyone joining it. This is in Christian statesman. But that the national reformers accept, expect such a condition of affairs as this is not all. They are doing and will do their very best to create it, not out of the love of the Bible, nor for Christianity, but for their own self-aggrandizement. So you, you see this push by um, the false protestantism and national reform movement. The national reform movement of 1880s and the apostate protestantism of today, their push is not being made out of the love of the word of God and the Bible, but for their own self-profit that they may have uh, gathered their power together for the, last, for the last great battle. That is the battle of Armageddon. Now, look at this. But whether they will heed these scriptures or not, there is one thing certain, that is, by the evidence here presented, it is perfectly clear that the direct aim of the leaders in the national reform movement is the exaltation of themselves into a hierarchy, as absolute as that of Mormonism or as was that of the papacy in the super supremest hours of the Dark Ages. They deliberately propose to make themselves the arbiters of every controversy. Thus, they will make themselves the vice, vice gerents of the Lord and the fountain of all law. Hence, what they deem as heresies become civil crimes and liable to civil punishments. And then 
Alonzo Trevor Giones refers to 2 Timothy 4.3. Reverend J.C.K. Milligan asked the question, how is the amendment to be carried out practically? And in the answer to this question, he made this statement. In brief, it is adoption will at once make the morality of the Ten Commandments to be the supreme law of the land, and anything in the state constitutions and laws that is contrary to them will become unconstitutional. Think about that for a moment, that um, this reverence of Sunday churches are saying that the Ten Commandments will become the law of the land. Which, which Ten Commandments are they talking about, by the way, really? We will have to see in a little while. And uh, the fourth commandment, let us uh, look at the fourth commandment and how they, they plan to play around with it. We have, of course, who? Now you have it. Seventh day, Adventists who claim to know and interpret well the fourth commandment and keep the seventh day, Saturday as the Sabbath. Now it starts hitting you directly. You, you can feel that pressure on your heart. It's like somebody sitting on your chest. You know, when... Seventh day Adventism is mentioned in this bracket of uh, the apostate Protestantism pushing for a Christian constitution in USA. You know that you have a problem because they are not going to fold their hands and let you speak or interpret the scriptures for them. Let us hear the matter then. We have, of course, the Seventh-day Adventists who claim to know and interpret well, interpret well the Fourth Commandment and keep the Seventh-day Saturday as the Sabbath. There are the National Reformers and the Evangelical Christians generally who profess to keep the commandment and they keep the first day Sunday. Then between these extremes, there lies a third class who are not Jewish. Neither are they classed as Evangelical Christians, yet they profess to be Christians and profess to keep the fourth commandment, we refer to Muslims and other non-Saturday and Sunday believers. This insists that to obey the commandment, this insists that to obey the commandment, but with no reference whatsoever to the fourth commandment. So we have uh, Seventh-day Adventists, we have the Evangelicals, we have the apostate Protestantism, that is the National Reformers, and there is the fourth class, which are Muslims. Let, let us see how they will fare in this Christian constitution. It is evident that all these discordant views of the bearing of the fourth commandment are not going to be reconciled by the adoption of the proposed amendment to the constitution. We cannot have uh, four groups worshipping on different days and then have a Christian constitution. That is what they are saying. And as that commandment will then be part of the national constitution, that is the fourth commandment, the question of the meaning of commandment and of what day is to be observed in obeying the commandment will have to be decided in the Supreme Court of the United States. And Mark, if the Supreme Court be left to itself, if the court be allowed to sit simply as a court of law, when the question should come up for decision, it will do so as a question of law and not of theology. So this is a Christian nation wanting the Ten Commandments to control the whole world. And then the Fourth Commandment has to be interpreted by the Supreme Court. And since the court of law is the arbiter of interpretation of constitutional matters, then it will appear as the question of the law and not of theology. But hold on a minute. Where, where are we headed? Considering it therefore as a question of law, the court will be guided by the acknowledged rules that are laid down for the interpretation of law and statute. Let us try the interpretation of the commandment by some of these rules. Chancellor Kent, in his commentaries, lays down this rule. The words of a statute, if of common use, are to be taken in their natural, plain, obvious, and ordinary signification and import. The guy is so super good in how the law is to be interpreted. That um, it has to be natural, plain, obvious, and ordinary signification and import. The first question then is, are the words of the fourth commandment such as are of common use? Look at them and see. 
the only answer that there can be is they are they are of common use they are natural they are plain they are obvious and they are of ordinary signification it doesn't need somebody with a phd to interpret it there is not a word in the commandment that is not of common use that is in the fourth commandment then the judges have no alternative the words are to be taken in their natural plain obvious and ordinary signification and import praise the lord for that if the matter is left to the supreme court but then hold on a minute we continue with this presentation and you can see how alonzo trevor jones is reasoning in these things the honorable john a bingham was appointed by the house of representatives to conduct the impeachment of president johnson in the course of that trial, Mr. Bingham stated this rule of law. When words are plain in a written law, there is an end to all construction. There is no discussing such a thing when the word is plain. Like if I tell you go home, the words are plain. You, you don't ask me what do you mean that go home. The words are so plain to be misunderstood even by a child. So you, you see even the children in school, the, 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 the ones two years, three years, four years old, when they are told that the bell is ringing, go home. They don't ask the teacher, teacher, what do you mean by we go home? The words are plain. That is what uh, Mr. Bingham is saying. And so the words must be followed. This is a wonderful and good statement, but is this what the Supreme Court is going to do, say, at the end of the day? Just take the fourth commandment, it's the Sabbath, it is Saturday, well and good, let everyone worship on Saturday. Let us hear what it's being spoken. The words of the fourth commandment being of common use must be plain. Then the court is allowed no latitude for construction. It must follow the plain words of the statute. What is the purpose of the fourth commandment? It is to secure the keeping of the Sabbath day. For the first sentence is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But what day is the Sabbath day? The commandment itself tells, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Remember that we are asking this question from the standpoint of law and not of theology. We are examining it as it will have to be examined should the national reform movement succeed or apostate Protestantism. These are the very questions that the judges of the Supreme Court will have to ask. And if they are to follow the rules of law and the words of the then constitution, these are the very answers that they will have to make. The judges must follow the words of the statute as jurists, they can do nothing else. Therefore, if the court be left to itself and to the principles and rules of civil law, as everybody knows that Saturday is the seventh day, it follows inevitably that as surely as, surely as the national reform movement succeeds, everybody in the United States will have to keep what? Saturday as the Sabbath. Now, the question is asked, keep Saturday for Sabbath? Is this what the national reform and the posted protestantism are looking for? Is that what the national reformers desire to accomplish? Is that what they are aiming at? The answer is no. Indeed not they. For the court is not to be left to itself and to the rules of civil law because this is a Christian constitution and it doesn't need people who are vast in civil laws but people who are vast in christian matters so the supreme court cannot be left to the civil lawyers to decide the signification of the fourth commandment and so who is called upon to be uh, an assistant in interpreting interpreting the fourth commandment such a decision as that the national reformers never will allow and right here is where their hierarchy comes in here is where they appear as the interpreters of scripture on all questions of morals. Here is the point at which they step in with their final decisions. For as soon as such an interpretation as that is proposed, they will assert that that is not the correct interpretation. They will say that the rules of civil law do not apply in the interpretation of religious statute. That is a theological question and it must be decided by theological definitions. They will say that the unanimous verdict of the theological world on this question is that the expression seventh day in the fourth commandment does not mean the definite seventh day of the week, but one day in seven. 
you, you, you see the kind of gymnastics that starts with the apostate Protestantism and the national reformers when they want the American constitution to be changed into a Christian constitution. One day of the rest alter six days of work. That in the Jewish dispensation the day kept was Saturday, but in the Christian dispensation the first day of the week is the Christian Sabbath that it is in fact the distinct badge of Christianity, that this has been by constitutional amendment declared to be a Christian nation, and as this commandment is part of the constitution, it must be interpreted by the rules of Christian theology. Can there be any doubt as to which way the question uh, will be decided? Not the least, it will have to be decided in favor of the prevalent Christianity and the Christian Sabbath will thus be declared to be the Sabbath in this government. But by whom is the question decided? By whom is the final decision made? Not by the judges, but by the theologians. For the judges deal with civil matters, and the theologians deal with moral uh, matters. Not by the court, but the, by the leaders and teachers in our churches. And that is nothing else than the rule of a hierarchy. So here, and by this, we are brought face to face with another important consideration. In fact, the culmination of national reform purposes and aims, it is this, as all these questions are to be decided not as a question of law, but of, the th of theology, and as the leaders and teachers in the churches are to be the interpreters on moral and theological points, it uh, follows that the success of the national reform movement will be the destruction of all distinction between law and theology, between civil and religious affairs. All the courts of the land will be not courts of law but courts of theology, and every question of government and of life will become a theological question, subject to the supervision and the final decision of these leaders and teachers in the churches all of which will be but to turn this government into a man-made theocracy with the leaders of national reform in the seat of God. Now, this is what we read. Even when the question of the Sabbath is decided, we do not believe that all Seventh-day Baptists and all the Seventh-day Adventists and all the Jewish in the country are going to accept and conform to the decision without coercion or coercion. But coercion will be persecution, while if there be no coercion, the reformed constitution will be set at defiance, and all the work of the national reformers will be in vain. But as we are not to suppose for a moment that they are working in vain, it follows that the success of national reform will certainly bring persecution, but that is only to carry out the spirit of the papacy, that is a on national reform movement. Now. I believe that uh, you can get a glimpse of uh, the 1880s story and uh, what is coming before us. The same constitution they were pushing in 1880s is the same constitution that uh, the apostate Protestantism are ready to use to bring about the Sabbath observance in this United States. So. Let us continue considering the matter. The presentation we are having is Maranatha. It won't be long. And uh, I'm glad that uh, Christ is coming. As they plan to do all their planning, there's only thing we can plan to do. And it is not a plan of tomorrow, it's a plan of today, to give our hearts to the Lord. You can't plan to hide nowhere in this world. You can't plan to move to another planet. You can't plan anything. The only thing you can plan and be able to succeed in is to give your heart to the Lord. And uh, whether they kill the body, that is nothing. Fear him who can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. And so we are reading these things not to be scared. We are reading them to be encouraged in the Lord that what the devil is planning will come to nothing. He can only have a temporal rule on this earth, but he shall be lost eternally, he and his forces. And you be sure that uh, all that is not for God 
it is going to be destroyed soon and very soon and so maranatha it won't be so long we continue and so national reform and the rights of conscience what does it mean when they say enforce enforce according to webster is to force to constrain to compel to execute with vigor therefore the propo proposition of the national reformers is to force to compel all to keep the laws of christian morality and to execute with vigor upon all the laws of christian morality in the christian statements of november 1 1883 mr w j coleman one of the principal exponents of the national reform re religion replied to some questions that had been put by a correspondent who signed himself truth seeker and then we copy the following so after these things being brought into limelight in 1883 um a respondent call, called truth seeker post some questions to these people and let us look at these questions because they are the same question we are asking and the answers have been provided so don't continue looking for answers because we have the answers already the truth seeker asked what effect would the adoption of the christian amendment together with the proposed changes in the constitution have upon those who deny that god is the sovereign christ the ruler and the bible the law this brings up the conscience question at once the classes who would object are as truth seeker has said jewish infidel atheist and others the work of the national reform movement is to differentiate every logically consistent infidel that is the answer and so what is the agenda reverend eb graham, graham at national reform convention held at uh, new york uh, at York, Nebraska, and reported in the Christian Statement of May 21, 1885, responds to these questions. We might add, in all justice, if the opponents of the Bible do not like our government and it is Christian features, let them go to some wild, desolate land and in the name of the devil and for the sake of the devil, subdue it and set up a government of their own on infidel and atheistic ideas and then if they can stand it stay there till they die how christian is that language for a moment this is a person who is stand saying that uh, they are going to stand for the protection of the ten commandments and uh, representatives of god and uh, try to bring morality not only in america but in other parts of the world. But then if somebody comes and object their interpretation of the scriptures as it will be contained in the national constitution, then he has some information for you and you better listen and listen so good. You may go to any land, uh, some wild land, desolate land, and in the name of the devil, and for the sake of the devil, subdue it and set up a government of your own on infidel and atheistic ideas and then if you can stand it stay there till you die that is if you differ with them now reverend jonathan edward adds and they have some big names they are bishop they are reverends some good names to think about they ask should we tolerate atheism so seventh day adventism jewish muslim is what atheism why because it doesn't really accept their interpretation of the scripture. So, should we tolerate atheism? There is nothing out of hell that I will not tolerate as soon. Whatever opposes national reform is atheism, i.e. atheist, deist, Jewish, and seventh-day keepers. Such a liberty as that, the papacy at the height of its power was willing and anxious to grant. Indeed, of that kind of liberty, the Inquisition was the best conservator the world has ever seen. Whatever the national reform movement is calling atheism is really disturbing to such a person like me and you and the whole of the Bible conforming Christian. Now, who are the people behind this coming catastrophe in the time that it was being mandated in 1880s? 
In a list given in the Christian Statement of December 24, 1885, we find the names of 11 bishops, 16 college presidents, 15 college professors, 3 ex-governors, 7 justice, justices of Supreme Courts, 5 judges of Superior Courts, 2 judges of the United States District Court, and uh, uh, the list goes on and on. And so, the National Reform as an absurd. The people who are working on these things, who are working on these things in 1880s, were not just uh, some poor folk in the in the village who don't understand things. They are people with minds. They are people with influence. And uh, you can bear me bear me witness that uh, the people who are working on this right now are not mere men uh, of uh, uh, some foolish education, but uh, what you call higher education, which in turn also is just but uh, foolishness. And so people like Kenneth Copeland, people, you, you can name these big names wherever they are, people who are saying, let us bring America back to God. And uh, let, let me give a disclaimer that um, some of these people, God says that uh, they, they think that they are doing good for the nation, but only if they could rely on God and see what they are up to, they will know that they are giving life to the image of the beast. And it will be at the expense of eternity that they will find too late they were working against God. And so the sooner they wake up and take their Bibles and read the way it is, the better. And then you have a duty and I have a duty to make sure that they know they are not working for God but they are working against God. You have a duty and I have a duty. And so national reform is an absurdity. Another absurdity of the national reform is that the nation being a moral person must have a religion of its own and exercise itself about religious affairs. Christian Statement, February 28, 1884, page 5. Take the citations, look at these papers and know if what you are hearing is truth and what they are planning or the plan there is truth and what the... We shall look uh, at uh, the national reform in our day. We are looking at 1880s, but we are traveling a journey. They want to have control over the government enterprise. Listen, your action in thus multiplying trains to discredit the day of rest in the, the, is in direct violation of divine law. In view of your responsibilities to God, you cannot afford to do this. So anyone is not allowed to run his business on the Lord's Day, which is Sunday. They are not to have sports. They are not to have anything apart from being in the church and doing that. I read to you previously that uh, even they outlawed uh, the doing of business on uh, Saturday and on Monday because the two days were near Sunday and Sunday was divine. That is the absurdity of the national reform movement and still people can think that uh, these are people being led by God. This apostate protestantism you have yet to see it is true colors. There are many American purposes. The American purpose, this is uh, the second beast of Revelation chapter 13. There are many who are disposed to attribute any view of Roman Catholicism in the United States and the world as a whole to bigotry or childishness. Such as see nothing in the character and attitude of Romanism that is hostile to our free institutions or find nothing potentious in its growth. Let us then first compare some of the fundamental principles of our government with those of the Catholic Church. The Constitution of the United States guarantees liberty of conscience. Nothing is clearer or more fundamental. For Pius, that is um, the eighth, in his um, ecclesiastical letter of August 1584, said, "The absurd and erroneous doctrines are ravings or ravings in defense of liberty of conscience are pestilential error, a pest of all others, most to be dreaded in a state." The same Pope, in his encyclical letter of December 8, 1864, anathemizes those who assert the liberty of conscience and of religious worship, also all such as maintain that the church may not employ force. Now, the pacific tone of Rome in the United States does not imply a change of heart. She is tolerant where she is helpless, says Bishop O'Connor. Religious liberty is merely endured until the opposite can be carried into effect without peril to the Catholic world. So as long as we can 
really exercise our religion without hurting the Catholic Church, then she can tolerate that. But uh, when it reaches a time that uh, she feels that uh, she is being infringed, then you, sh you will see her rise up. The Archbishop of St. Louis once said, Heresy and unbelief are crimes, and in Christian countries as in Italy and Spain, for instance, where all the people are Catholics, and where the Catholic religion is an essential part of the law of the land, they are punished as other crimes. No, how, the, the question I always ask is, how Christian is Italy and Spain? You have your answer. Every cardinal, archbishop, and bishop in Catholic Church takes an oath of allegiance to the Pope, in which occur the following words, heretic, schismatics, and rebels to our said Lord the Pope, or his aforesaid successors, I will to my uttermost persecute and oppose. Cardinal Manning advises Romanists throughout the world to enter politics as Romanist, and to do this especially in England and the United States. In our large cities, the priests are already in politics and some to a purpose. They are not just there to receive salary at the end of the month. How then can the world be fighting for Roman principles to guide and govern the conscience of their nations? We are perfectly assured that if ever Romanism gains such a power in this government, it will be through the mediumship and by the instrumentalities of the National Reform Party. For as crafty, as crude, as bitterly opposed to our free institutions as Rome is, as this book shows is, and as men know that she is, yet the national reformers or apostate Protestantism are willing and even anxious to join hands with her, that is clasping the hand of the papacy, and enlist her in the promotion of their scheme of so-called reform. In saying that the national reformers are willing and even anxious to join hands with Romanism in America, we only state the sober truth as proved by the following statement from an editorial in the Christian Statement of December 11, 1884. What does it say? Listen to another statement by the National Reform Movement. Whenever they, the Roman Catholics, are willing to cooperate in resisting the progress of political atheism, we will gladly join hands with them. And so Great Controversy says that um, the Af uh, uh, posted Protestantism have been patronizing with Romanism at, uh, until the, the, Roman, uh, the Roman Church itself wonders what this is all about. Blind people seeking for other blind people. In his encyclical letter published in 1885, um, um, Pope Leo XIII, I presume, says, all Catholics should do all in their power to cause the constitutions of states and legislation to be modeled on the principle of the true church, and all Catholic writers, journalists should never lose sight for an instant from the, uh, from the, of the above prescriptions. Therefore, what the national reformers propose to do with our constitution and legislation is precisely what uh, the Roman Catholics in this country are commanded by the Pope to do. Therefore, the aim of the national rule reform and the aim of Rome are identical and why should they not gladly join hands Revelation 13 3 talks about it and so you have the first beast and the second beast now clasping hands we continue and by there I love history and that is why you are seeing me read this it is it is interesting although it makes the blood shiver but with Christ all shall be well. But that the national reformers will gladly join hands with Rome is not all of the story, not near all. They actually and deliberately propose to make overtures to Rome for cooperation. They actually propose to make advances and repeated advances and even to suffer rebuffs to gain the help of Rome in their Romish scheme of national Christianity. Proof of this is in the Christian statement of August 31, 1881, where Reverend Sylvester F. Scovel a leading national reformer says, this common interest of all religious people in the Sabbath Sunday ought both to strengthen our determination to work and our readiness to cooperate in every way with our Roman Catholic fellow citizens. We may be subjected to some rebuffs in our first profess, and the time is not yet come when the Roman church will consent to strike hands with other churches as such, 
but the time has come to make repeated advances and gladly to accept cooperation in any form in which they may be willing to exhibit it. It is one of the necessities of the situation. Who will form the image of the beast then? The success of the national reform or the apostate Protestantism movement will be the success of Rome. Therefore, to support the national reform or the apostate Protestantism is to support what? Is to support Rome. The clergy, when we read about uh, what uh, happened uh, back in the Dark Ages, we find that the clergy interfered with every man's private concerns, ordered how he should govern his family, and often took upon themselves should the personal control of his household. Clarendon under the year 1640 emphatically says, the preacher reprehended the husband, governed the wife, chastised the children, and insulted over the servants in the houses of the greatest men. Their minions, the elders, were everywhere for each parish, was divided into several quarters, and to each quarter one of these officials was allotted, in order that he might take special notice of what was done in his own district. Besides, these spies were appointed so that nothing could escape their supervision. Not only the streets, but even private houses were searched and ransacked to see if anyone was absent from church while the minister was preaching. Now, you see, we have only thought that the Sunday law is uh, to prohibit worship on Sabbath, that is Saturday. The Sunday law is to make sure that on Sunday no one is in the house but is in the church. And which church? Not a Seventh-day Adventist church, but a Sunday church listening to a Sunday sermon. Let that one sing in for a minute. I read the story, and uh, you can go back and uh, look uh, at um, that was um, which uh, presentation. It was uh, facing the future with courage. You can go and look at that because the story that follows is the story I read uh, the other time about um, how they forced the mother to kick out the son and uh, uh, she will not host her. And even they worked on her mind until she promised to bring her son to the law if the son came back home. And so uh, the, I won't read this, but uh, I'll go to what happened in uh, eighteen eighties. I, I leave what happened in dark ages and come to eighteen eighties. Ruth Ford's free disputation against pretended liberty of conscience says, we hold that toleration of all religions is not fair from blasphemy. If wolves be permitted to teach what is right in their own erroneous conscience, and there be no magistrate put to shame, magistrate to put them to shame, Judges 18.7, and knocking to punish them, then godliness and all that concerns the first step of the law must be mad. That is wild and atheistical uh, liberty of conscience notes 199 and 200. So they are saying that uh, only they, they can preach and your work is to listen. And those who have their interpretation differing from them, there are what? Wolves and wolves cannot be permitted to teach what is right in their own erroneous conscience without the magistrate, the judges, or the king punishing them. In 1880s, we read this. Baseball and the Blue Laws of 1880s and the Blair Law. And at one time in our history, baseball became caught up in the shrill debate over proposed Blue Laws. To outlaw athletic events on Sunday as a discretion of the Sabbath. In no state did this conflict play out more dramatically than Arkansas. In 1885, the Arkansas legislature outlawed Sunday baseball along with a host of other activities. 
Look at this. Seventh-day Adventists who do not recognize Sunday as the Sabbath were especially unwelcome in Arkansas during the 1880s, when more than 200 were prosecuted. Moreover, the conservative forces unleashed a torrent of bills to bolster their defense of the Sabbath, outlawing golf, tennis, and fishing on Sundays, forbidding the sale of gasoline on Sundays, prohibiting men and women swimming together, and prohibiting women's bathing suits which strike above the knee. On the second day of March 1885, <clears throat> the legislature of Arkansas repealed the law allowing any person to observe as the Sabbath any day of the week that they preferred and compelled them to keep the Christian Sabbath or first day of the week. Continued on, <clears throat> the effect of this change worked a hardship on a class of citizens in this country known as Seventh-day Adventists who observed the seventh instead of the first day of the week. As the Lord's Sabbath, there were five, as the Lord's Sabbath, there were five or six of them indicted, and some of them the second time by the grand jury of this country for the violation of this law. In fact, these people were the only ones that were indicted for Sabbath breaking during the two years in which this law was in force. Respectfully, Benji C. Fisga, Fizhas, Justice of the Peace, Malvern Hot Spring Company. That is uh, in 1898, Jonas, uh, speaking about this. He says, when he was presenting his case before the court, Etijones says, and this is in arguments of Alonzo Trevor Jones before the Senate Committee, Washington, D.C., uh, 1889. He says, he, when he was arguing in the court, let me, sir, illustrate the operation of the present law by one or two examples. A Mr. Swearigen came from a northern state and settled on a farm in Arkansas County. That is, I think. His farm was four miles from town and far away from any house of religious worship. He was a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And after having sacredly observed the Sabbath of the people Saturday by abstaining from all secular work, he and his son, a lad of 17, on the first day of the week, went quietly about their usual avocations. They disturbed no one, interfered with the rights of no one, but they were observed and reported to the grand jury. Indicted, arrested, tried and convicted, fined, and having no money to pay the fine, these moral Christian citizens of Arkansas were dragged into the county jail and imprisoned like felons for 25 days. And for what? For daring in the so-called the land of liberty in the year of our Lord 1887 to worship God. Was this the end of the story? Alas, no, sir. They were turned out and the old man's only horse, his sole reliance to make bread for his children, was levied on to pay the fine and costs, amounting to $38. That was a lot of money that time. The horse sold at auction for $27. A few days afterward, the sheriff came again and demanded $36. $11 balance due on fine and cost, and $25 for board for himself and son while in jail. So you even paid to be imprisoned. And when the poor old man, a Christian, mind you, told him with tears that he had no money, he prom promptly levied on his only cow, but was pursued to accept bond, and the amount was paid by contribution from his friends of the same faith. Sir, my heart swells to bursting with indignation as I repeat to you the infamous story. Now, Never did this message apply with greater force than it applies to us today. More and more, the world is setting at naught the claims of God. Men have become bold in transgression. The wickedness of the inhabitants of the world has almost filled up the mesh of their iniquity. This earth has almost reached the place where God will permit the destroyer to work his, upon, his will upon it. The substitution of the laws of men for the law of, of, of God the exaltation by merely human authority of Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath is the last act in the drama, 7141.1. It was the last drama in 1880s. If God had not interposed, we wouldn't be here today. But now, 
we ask ourselves, this is what was happening down in 1880s. Is this thing happening today? Is this thing happening today? Let us uh, look at some of the things that are happening today in the second segment of this. And uh, I'm uh, just uh, merely rehearsing things that you people know about. In September 23rd and 24, 2015, Pope was in Congress, and for what reason? To address the Congress. This is not something concerning the civil law, but it's something concerning the moral law. And uh, we are seeing this uh, co co coercion and consensus going on. In uh, September 25th, 2015, he addressed the United States, and then later on, they were able to plant their flag at the United States. And now, um, they are recognized. And remember, they are not just recognized as uh, a civil nation, per se, but now they are recognized there as uh, a Christian nation, as uh, an habit of the truth. Not only that, but um, your late president, uh, uh, not your late, but your previous president, Trump, tried to make sure that uh, what happened in 1880s was about to happen in America in, her, in his tenure. If I am president, Christianity will have power in the U.S. That is not as late as just 2016. Donald Trump vowed to close the gap between church and state. Donald Trump promises evangelicals great power, higher church attendance. It is interesting that is what the national reformers were doing in 1880s. And this is what is happening in America. We are seeing these voices rising once again. We are told that uh, this is like uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. First, there was the appearing of Cestius, a withdrawal of a few years, and then Titus came and destroyed Israel and Jerusalem. Now, we are seeing this concession. It was there in 1880s, but now it's coming back, and it's not going to go away for the third time. The, the people will have their own uh, way. Donald Trump wants to meet Pope Francis on upcoming trip to Italy. You may say, oh, Donald Trump now is not the president, and so things have changed. No, the Republicans and the Democrats are one coin having two sides. You cannot separate them. Whoever wins the election does not affect the other. It's just one coin on different sides. And so may the Lord help us if we shall live in this time and age. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, and shall make provision for the propagation of purple falsehood and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan, and that the end is near. This is um, Science of the Time, page 451. And uh, we are seeing those advances running swiftly. And uh, as the approach of the Roman armies was assigned to the disciples of the impending destruction of Jerusalem. And so we are told in uh, Signs of the Time, page 451, that uh, this apostasy uh, may be assigned to us that the limit of God's forbearance uh, has reached its measure. And... Uh, you, you can see there, the leading uh, evangelicals, this is uh, who? Kenneth Copeland. You remember Tony Palmer, who is deceased right now, and the leading uh, evangelicals meeting with this man and uh, uh, discussing these things. In Mark, uh, uh, in Mark chapter 4, verse 28, we are told, For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle because the harvest is come. This sounds like Revelation chapter 14 when the third angel's message is uh, coming to an end. And so we can understand that um, everything is pointing to the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of the air. The nations of this earth are ready. The only people who are not ready is the church. If the church becomes ready then we must uh, know that uh, we have 
reach the end of everything. But alas, the church is not ready. And so the Lord is still stretching his hand upon the nation, uh, the, the churches, so that uh, um, his people may be prepared for what is coming and, uh, and uh, they may not be caught unaware as the thief in the night. And so we are standing uh, on the threshold of everything. And uh, I just want to read the last sentiments as we bring this to an end then. In uh, Maranatha, page 180, paragraph 1, we are looking at the last points. The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christian, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation, the United States, in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. Now, you, you ask, should you be waiting right now? No, the, these were statements which were written long time ago, and uh, what we are seeing is a culmination of events, not a beginning of events but um, an end of events. And then the question is asked, is asked, who shall be able to stand? It is only those whose life has been hidden in Christ and um, their names are in the book, in the Lamb's book of life. And so, um, Great Controversy, page 592. Great Controversy, page 592, we read this. Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. And even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Liberty of conscience, which has caused so great a sacrifice, will no longer be respected. In the soon coming conflict, we shall see exemplified the prophet's words, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keepeth the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus Christ. Soon and very soon we shall realize the import of um, these words that we are reading. And so uh, the last slide, the last slide. Let us read the last slide together. This is coming from Spalding and Magan. When the four angels let go, Christ will set up his kingdom. None receive the latter rain but those who are doing all they can. Christ will help us. All could be overcome us by the grace of God. Amen. Through the blood of Jesus, praise the Lord. All heaven is interested in the work. Angels are interested. Think ye that he will bring his hand unto himself until he has accomplished the object for which he stretched it out? Yea, more bitter hatred against those that keep the law than against the Catholics. Truth, the truth, let it shine. Hold them by the side of truth. What are they rich in? They seek falsehood, deception, and cunning. Behold, where is their strength? Is it in the truth? A mere knowledge of the truth will never save. How long then? angel of God, before the message will go forth with a loud voice, other things to be accomplished, they must make themselves more vile. If Jesus should make his appearance in their midst, they will despise him. They advocate their errors for a while until the people get disgusted with it. Then they add another. Nights upon their beds, horror gets hold upon them. Can ye not see it? Live unto God. He has got them safe in the snare. The honest are getting disgusted. Satan works at the very ones that do him the most harm. God can make them a host against their enemies. Ye give up too quick, ye let go soon. That arm, the arm of God is mighty. Satan works in different ways to steal the mind off from God. Victory, victory, we must have it over every wrong. A solemn sinking into God. Get ready, Set thy house, thine house, in order. That is what I can say 
for such a moment as this. And I pray as uh, Hezekiah wept before the Lord, we shall weep before the Lord and tell him, spare thy people. May the Lord bless us. May he continue guiding us. And as the title says, and that is what I say also, that uh, Maranatha, it won't be long. And so, come Lord Jesus, come. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, thank you. We have nothing to fear lest we forget the way you have led us in our past history. And looking at every advance of step, we can just say, really, you are Ebenezer. This far that we have come, you have been a God who doesn't fail and will never fail. And so, give us the strength to be able to go through the ordeal that is before us. Prepare our hearts that no any member of it may be given to the working of the evil one. Victory, victory is assured for us. I thank you and uh, I glorify your name for these great things that you have written for us. And you have made them to uh, transpire so that your children may know that really the history of the great I am is true and it will come to fulfillment. Glory and honor be unto thy name. In Christ Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.